Hey, you there. Thank you for watching, and welcome to Forge the Lines Forever. Today, I have a 5v5 custom matcher on the most amazing new Axis map generator. So let's go ahead and introduce our teams and our players, starting off with Team 1 here down in the southwest corner of the map, ending with Team 2 in the northeast. I am going to slow it down to negative 2. Do enough, we have enough time to cover that early action. Starting off with the rear guard air slot here for Team 1. It is Pepe's going first land as a UEF. He is a 1300 in pack man yellow to his east in Snow White. We have another UEF player of T1 Hero going first land as a 1200 in Regal Purple. We have AI Adaptive going first land as the third UEF here for Team 1. He is a 1500, and again, he is in Regal Purple. And to his northwest, one of the two Sirens here for Team 1. It is Zero Rue going first land in Amethyst Purple as a 1300. And to the northwest, the last player to introduce on Team 1 is Arima underscore going first land as a Seraphim as well as a 2000 rated player. And remember, he is the highest rated player on Team 1 and in the game overall. So for Team 1 side of the map, they have three UEF and two Seraphim, which means no Cybrans and no Aeon for Team 1. Starting off with the rear guard air slot for Team 2. In the northeast corner, we have Petergy, Savo, Pokan. We're going to call him BSP or Petergy for short. He's going first land as another UEF here in this game. This time it's on, obviously, Team 2. He's at 1,500 in light oak tan. And in lightish red pink, we have Martin Key or H333 going first land as a UEF in as a 1,200 rating. And in Batman Gray, we have Solid Snake. Very fitting color for the player of Solid Snake because of those familiar for the Medicare Solid franchise. I mean, at least for me, I when I typically think of Solid Snake, I think of a very dark outfit. So, you know, Batman Gray definitely fits with that vibe. He is a 1600. The second highest rated player in the game tied with Zum on his team. He is a UEF, and he is, again... A UEF going first land in Forest Green, my favorite color and faction in the game combination. It is literal. He is a 1400 in Forest Green as a UEF. And last but not least, again, tied for the highest rated player on Team 2. It is Zum going first land as a Seraphim, the only Seraphim on Team 2. He is in Stitch Blue, and he is, again, a 1600. So for Team 2 side of things, they have four UEF and one Seraphim. The difference being that Team 1 has three UEF and two Seraphim. Team 2 has four UEF and one Seraphim, which also means there are no Sirens and no Aeons. So apologies for those spiky space socialists and those loyal to the princess. Your factions are not represented in this game, but hopefully you will enjoy the game nonetheless. So let's go ahead and look at Reclaim currently still on the map and for... 10 players, we have about 10,000 mass, so about 1,000 mass per player is a decent amount of mass to scoop up. I forgot to change the icons uh, for the numbers. I think they were a little bit too big. I'll probably adjust that between the next the next cast and this one. But if it's good at this uh, at this size, I guess, let me know down in the comments, because it's, sometimes it's hard to read those numbers, especially when I watch other FAF casters, so this is a good size. Please do let me know. And in terms of mass point layouts, let's take Team 1's side of the map. Honestly, for five people on Team 1, most of their mass will come from the southern section of the map. There is a Trimax here, a Trimax here, and Trimax here. And that's really... I mean, maybe that's a double max. Maybe I'll classify that as a double max. But that's really about it. Um... There's not really a lot of mass. For five players in probably about a 15 by 15 map, there's really not a lot of mass. I mean, talking about obviously for one team. So there's going to be a lot of raiding going on, trying to either deny mexes, of course, or at least try to claim territory. We see that actually from Team 1's Adaptive AI, or AI Adaptive. I think I'll call him Adaptive AI because it's... I don't know why, but seeing it the other way is weird. He has a tiny little mech marine and a, and a little bit bigger snoop hanging out. So a T1 you know, assault bot and a land scout hanging out to just defer any sort of engineers that do come from that avenue. So let's go ahead and speed this game back up to zero and watch our players start duking it out. Hopefully no one missed me. 
or at least uh, used my videos as a way to, uh, you know, hamper that uh, miss missing. I don't even know where I'm going with this. Oh, I am going with this. I am grateful for all the comments, all the likes, everything that everybody gave me on the other videos. Thank you so much. I have very limited internet on my cruise, so I wasn't really able to... I saw notifications, but that's really about it. The internet on those cruise ships are expensive per day, and there's, you know, obviously focusing on spending time with my wife and being on at sea for the very first time. I, it was my first cruise, so I was you know, trying to get used to being on the boat. I didn't have any issues with seasickness, so that was good. But, uh, you know, obviously... You know, all the food, all the drinks, all the everything. It just kind of takes a lot out of you. So it was nice to have that week to just decompress and kind of just relax from all the worries of life and the nonsense that does come with it. But we do see Team 2 isn't really going to fall for that uh, couple of units there. It does look like they were able to take out one of those units. I what? That is a wreck. Why isn't it showing me a uh, reclaim value? That's really weird. Everything else is showing me a reclaim value. Huh. That's really weird. Don't know why that's... Oh, maybe it's... Yeah, any, anyway, I don't know why it's not showing me a reclaim value. Anyway. We do see some tussles from some commanders here. We saw T1 Hero bapping away a couple of those scouts. And honestly, there's not really a lot of rating in terms of T1 bombers at all. That we do see one drop out here from Pepe's, and he's going. Where is he going with that? I wonder. He's going over here to the w east. I'm gonna drop it right behind a couple of tanks and an engineer. That will definitely get spotted by Team Two, so that probably won't succeed. But the one upper here will definitely be successful because it is isolated on an upper plateau. It is only one mechs, but again, one mechs. Not bad. You know, you can put maybe a T1 factory or something and not really worried about a whole lot because it is isolated from the land engagement, at least for the time being. We do see Team 2's Calm of Zum going for a gun speed and range upgrade on that Seraphim Commander. We're trying to output a lot of damage. Again, he's facing off against three UEF Commanders, so very bulky Commanders. And a couple of Seraphim, of course, but the UEF ones are down in the south where he currently is. A little bit of mismatch in terms of HP, but he is facing a possible 3v2 scenario here. We do see Adaptive AI going for his gun and range upgrade. Oh, sorry, damage and range, not gun and range. We do see some reinforcements in the way from Literal's commander as well, so it is going to be at least a 2v2. Maybe we'll see the calm of T1 come in back around and go after Zum. Or maybe he'll build a couple of PD. Actually, he won't because that is a lower plateau, not an upper plateau. So we'll see how that goes. Maybe he'll just cut all the way across and come back and loop around. We'll just have to keep checking back on that. We do see, again, the first com on com action of the game between Arima and Martin. Arima going for a T1 PD, trying to force Martin away. And Martin just going to sit there and just bap into the back of that commander. But as that T1 PD goes off, Martin will be forced to retreat, especially with more guns constantly going to be raining in here constantly. Another, actually a radar system coming online, and a T1 facility trying to be built, but it's being, of course, shot down by Martin. But uh, it does look like Arima is able to pump out enough of that uh, mass and energy to be able to build that and start pumping out a couple of T1 tanks. At least I'm assuming that's what he's building. If he's not building that, I don't know what he is, but uh, it does look like... Martin's going for the Hydro, and he's going to go for Engineer, actually, not for T1 tanks. And Arima's just going to sit here and just hang out. Not really, uh... And actually just go for T2. So, don't... I mean, if he has enough mass in the bar, which he really... Uh, he's still positive, so he... It, it's just kind of risky, especially because Martin's right here. We have a couple of T1 tanks here from Solid Snake, and we even have Betagy moving in from the north. So this T2 upgrade, it probably will finish, but it's going to hurt, especially with engineers trying to hurriedly build this up as quickly as he can. We can see Martin just raining in now into the T1 PD, and then eventually will go into the comm of Arima. But it does look like Martin is going to be forced back by a couple of forces from Arima, so it's not all is lost. And there are some reinforcements actually from Arima coming all the way from the north. It does look like Team 2 has a couple of holes to plug in sort of that regard. 
But down here in the south, let's check it back. We do see a couple of comms with some upgrades. Adaptive and Zum have their upgrades finished off. Lateral, not lateral, literal moving into assist. And Pepe is the air player, has moved in. Not necessarily all the way forward, but at least has a backline defense just in case. Couple of T1 bombers en route to Adaptive's location to probably go after Zum's commander. Zum does have a couple of T1 forces. Adaptive is by himself. But uh, it does look like Adaptive will actually target those units instead. Get some nice veterans. See a couple of bombers over the top for Zum. Uh, against Zum. Will uh, at least deter him a little bit, but probably not enough, especially with Literal on the move. I think they're going to get a kill here pretty soon. Second comm says Adaptive. And not uh, Adaptive, but Pepe's. And uh, yeah, that is uh, that is inbound. We have T1 bombers constantly raining in. It looks like all the inbound forces for Zum have been taken out. And now Pepe's has come in to intercept and assist. Adaptive is in the red sub. 1,500 hit points. It does look like Zum will just go for a murder-suicide situation here. And Pepe's will come in to try to assist the power body block. Uh, will he make it? No, he won't. But then again, Zum is in the red now because of that AOE explosion from Adaptive's commander. Zum is dropping below sub 500 hit points. There are a couple of bombers nearby. Both for Team 1's T1 Hero and Zero Zoo. Sorry, Zero Roo. But uh, not Zero Roo. Sorry, that was uh, Adaptive. But that those look like those bombers were shot down. But there are some interceptors inbound to help protect those commanders. I'm going to get a nice little napalm to the back. Does have a nice rank in veterancy, though. So it has a little bit more hit points a second reach in. But it does look like he will make it out of there. Sub, very low hit points. Just one solitary bomber is not going to be enough to crack that commander. You need probably a T2, you know, not the bomber or Janus or something to just burn away the rest of those hit points. But Pepe's will get away. He didn't have any upgrades on board that commander, and he is in the yellow. But he should be out of danger. Relatively no issue there. It does look like in the north, Team 2 was able to force back Team 1's Arima. And Arima is taking on, th well, essentially three commanders and two armies. We have one army here for Solid and one army here for Martin. Then we have the assistant commander of Betterji there in the middle. Does look like the middle's kind of just there to exist because it has to be. It doesn't look like one team or the other is getting a huge advantage. I do like the wall sections that are being built. In this direction, it forces the enemy units to move in in a, you know, essentially a not a diamond, but a triangle-shaped formation forces the units to kind of bottle up and mess with their maneuvering uh, capabilities and also just messes with their pathfinding. Kind of annoying when you have a couple of T4 units having to walk around and be scrunched together. Not, not really great. Not really great for movement. Definitely those very slow crabs or colossus because, well, they're slow. So that's just how it is. We do see another calm coming in here for Zero Roo, or for Team 1 coming out from Zero Roo, I should say. And Solid Snake's going to meet him head on. Solid Snake has the Zaf Amp and Zero Roo has the gun upgrade. And these comms are evenly matched, except Solid Snake is a little bit ahead of the game. He's almost at 1,000 veterancy, which means that he'll have a rank of veterancy here pretty soon. Give him additional hit points and regen overcharging, of course. If in the main stage of dealing a decent amount of damage, depending on how much power you have. But... Uh, you know, both comms are at the exact same range as one another. The only comm that would have the advantage in terms of uh, range would be the Aeon Sniper Commander, but those don't exist because there's no Aeon in this one. But uh, I think Solid Snake did get his rank convention. See that T2 Nathas are inbound here for Solid. Sorry, for Solid. 4 0 against Solid. And those uh, bombers are hitting, I mean, not entirely on target, but they're over, their AoE definitely will get some splash damage. And reinforcements here for Arima are going to actually push against Solid Snake. And we do see some attacks in the south. We'll take a look at that in a second after we see how this turns out. But Solid Snake was in the red, back in the yellow, now back in the red again. He's falling below. Units aren't intercepting. We have some T2 Yenzin online here for Arima. And I think that might just be it here for Solid Snake. He turned out gets a rank in Vegency very, very crucially. If these units don't move in to close the distance, it could be the amount of room that Solid Snake needs to get out of range. He focuses out the T2 units first. He might be able to get out of danger, but uh, he's falling below 600, uh, 500. A couple more shots. There he goes. Kaboom. It is now a 4v4 game here at 13 minutes, almost 13 minutes on the clock. And down in the south, we do see a nice push coming out here from Team 2. 
Those look like Arima is now microing the middle and the north. Sorry, the south and the north. And middle, south, north kind of thing. It does look like both <laughs> this look like both players in the middle kind of doing the same strategy. Except the rumor is like, nope, it's gonna build the whole wall and just hang behind it and uh, not worry about it. Team two will have a slight advantage in that regard because team one's units will be bottlenecked here and team two can actually move back and forth. That is a disadvantage for team one, but that is a obviously a disadvantage to building the whole wall section and allowing your units to actually retreat versus letting them sit there not essentially to die, but essentially to die. We do see in the north, we see Zero continuously pushing forward. He does have a nice group of units to watch out for because Martin with T2 on board, so not really a huge threat in terms of his comm directly, but he can build some PD. He's building a shield as we speak. Has a couple of Mongies and some pillars and a Flapjack, so mobile missile launcher. Zero needs to begin very, very cautious because if he pushes too far forward, he see he has no idea what's over there and he needs to get a radar online we do see one back here here for a Remo. they need a t2 just to get the amount of range on the map to be able to see just how much is out there last thing you want to do is send your most high valued asset in the game in the game being the commander out in the middle of nowhere that you think is nowhere actually actually it's in the middle of the enemy base not the best idea to do that T3 gunship is online here for better G, so we know he has T3 air online, and Zero has really nothing to fight this. Has a couple of T1 AA in the mix here. That's going to take a while to chew through 6,000 hit points aboard a heavy gunship. T1 AA back here as well. Now it's stationary and mobile fighting this uh, gunship. Does look like they're able to shoo the gunship away, but again, even if they do, the AA is definitely not... Uh, it's not great, but literal over here to the east being swarmed by T1 units by Arima that have swarmed all the way around. Cut off literal's escape plan. They're trying to body block him from getting into the water. They're doing a pretty good job so far. Literal gets some nice overcharges because they're grouping up very nice and tightly, but uh, he's fallen very, very quickly. He needs to get his butt in the water, but doesn't even matter because his head wasn't below the surface of the water. Now it's another kill here for Team 1. It's a 4v3 in favor of them. And let's see who inherits the base for literal. It will most likely be, uh, yeah, Zum definitely is over here to the east. He can micro the east and the middle pretty well. Leave the air player to, you know, deal with the air situation. Let's see what else is going on. We do see kind of a counterattack, kind of mounting here for Team Two's Martin, but he's just kind of fanning out just a little bit. A nice little poke attack, not necessarily. A concerted effort to go after that fire base with two commanders. Definitely not worth the risk to go after that. Couple of PD, couple of AA, obviously a Sarah from Shield. T2 Sarah from Commander coming online as well. So definitely high engineering suites on board those things. They can spam up a lot of defenses very, very quickly. Though so definitely gotta be aware of that here for Martin. Martin has control of everything in the west, and Zom has everything controlled of well everything else. And then we have the air player here for better G. So the APM going to start being attacked very, very quickly, especially before 20 minutes. It makes a huge difference having all your players alive before 20 minutes and after because the longer the game goes on, the more you're having to deal with microing multiple different fronts, the harder it is to focus, harder it is to remember, harder it is to do all that stuff because the game, the game is hard. Like, it, it just is. Even for, you know, 2,000 rated, 2,600 rated players, it is taxing. Now, those higher rated players have, are better experienced at it. Can essentially, It's like, um, it's like caf some, some, some people, it's like caffeine. The more they take, it, the more they take for a long period of time, the more it takes for them to get to the same level of essentially, not alertness, but that same kind of, I guess alcohol would be a better example. Like the more alcohol you take, the more alcohol it takes to get to that same point as it did before when you initially took alcohol, but would drink it. So it's the same kind of thing. Where there's just their tolerance. Their, and there we go. Ha! Ah, the tolerance level is higher. So they're able to stave off the effects of it for longer, but it still affects them. Where you can see, even in the west here, Rima, this is a huge attack here for Martin. There are some T2 forces inbound to intercept both in the back and in the front of this force. But it's still getting back here. T2 Mex is under threat. There is a T2 gunship nearby and a Natha. 
But uh, I don't see there's an AA. There is one T1. L there's a T2 AA, but the T2 AA is being attacked from the back. What I do love about this is that once the AA is gone, the bombers, the gunships, all of that will have no issue dealing with this. And it does look like Martin will just take his consolation prize, go after the T2 Max, and maybe get a set. Uh, no, there's not a lot of firepower left. He should have just gone for the T2 Max and called it a day, but he tried to push it in further. So Team 1, this is definitely a side to worry about for Team 1 because there's not really a lot of attention being paid to it. Team 2 has noticed that and is sending another force out to that west side. But Team 1 does have the northwest and the southeastern plateau section, so it does give them a nice little vantage point and allowing them to force Team 2 to not skirt the edge of the map for an air attack. They have to cut it a little bit. If that Raider gets up to T2, that could make all the difference. Nano coming on the way here for Zero in the north. He has Nano, T2, and Gun, so he's decently bulky at 17,000 versus the 13,000 for Arima. And it does look like Team One, T1 Hero is pushing out, trying to force back Zoom on this eastern side. Is doing the reverse of what you would normally see with plateaus, where you'd have units up here at the top shooting at the stuff at the bottom. But in this case, it's the opposite. We have units at the bottom of the plateau, or the bottom of the ravine, or whatever the heck this is called, shooting up over the, the ridge and going after stuff in the upper plateau. So environment can be used for or against you depending on what situation you find yourself in and what you use for it so definitely a good thing to watch out for in this game but we do see a large amount of units trying to intercept units outbound here from Zum. Zum going after the column of Pepe's or at least whatever was back here but a couple of mexes are down there are a couple of Ilshis as well but there's a lot of T1 units again a thousand of anything will kill anything so I praise the Ilshis. Ilshis, one of the best units, I think, in the game. Not counting T4, because those are obviously special units. They're experimental. They're different, obviously. But Ilshis, very, very good. Fast momentum. Fast momentum. Fast movement. Fast rap, you know, uh, fire rate. All of that. Good amount of hit points, especially for T2. Decent range as well. Very good unit, except, again, doesn't matter if you have a thousand Ilshi. No, it doesn't matter if you have... 100 Yoshis versus 1,000 T1 tanks. No, oh, I guess it depends. But my point being standing, not nothing is invincible in this game. So enough of attacks will eventually kill you. It's just, just how it is. We do see a couple of T3 units breaking through the middle here for Team 2. And I'm... Uh, yeah, they definitely came this way. I don't see them coming the other way. They have been intercepted here by forces, but Zero was taken out by Martin. We pause it just for a second. I want to check the reclaim. Does look like okay. There's a lot of units. Uh, it might have been PD. There's a couple of T3 units in the mix. I don't, I don't know why he really went for that. Uh, kind of weird. Anyways, maybe he thought he had a better force than he actually did. I don't know. But uh, that is now a 3v3 game here at 21 minutes. And Arima now facing a head-on collision here with these forces outbound from Martin. We have Flapjacks in the mix. We have T2 Pillars. We have T1 Mech Marines. We have T1 Assault Bots trying to just, again, soak up all of the, essentially be cannon fodder, again, and, and annoy the T2 PD. T2 PD, very good at taking out T1 units. And T2 units not bad, but uh, because they have you know direct fire weapons, they can't miss unless they're on a slope. Uh, they do very very well, except for the fact that well, in, again, any thousand of anything will kill anything. Narima seeing the danger goes, nope, I'm out of here. See you bye, and it's gonna go right into the ocean. And it looks like unlike Literal, who was body blocked over here in the east, he should have enough time to get his head under the water and not really have an issue. But that force is not stopping. It's going directly west. And we saw, as I mentioned earlier, that attack from the west, the northwest specifically, from Martin is able to now capitalize on the fact that this whole force will now be able to group together. There are T3 units coming to close this force together, so not as much of a smart idea to force this all the way together because those T3 units are ripping through whatever is here, and they're going to continue eastward. 
and just intercept those forces. It might just be a tie where everything's dead. But Mexas are dead, which is good. It does limit Team 1's eco. But is that worth the amount of mass and energy that it costs to build these units and keep these units here? You can see a lot. Yeah, I need to fix the how uh, what the range is to you know, group all those stuff together. Probably like right. Yeah, I need to fix that. I need to fix the grouping on that. Anyway, all right, talking about the mass uh, mass grouping reclaim thing mod that I have. Anyway. But while in the north, Team 2 is making a lot of progress and forcing Arima back, Team 1 is making a lot of progress and forcing back Zelma on this eastern side and essentially has turned this game into, instead of a diagonal, you know, northeast corner, southwest corner, there's now a north side versus south side with Team 1 occupying the entire southern edge, Team 2 occupying essentially the entire northern edge for a T2 mechs and a radar up there in the north for Team 1's Arima. I see missiles raining in constantly here. PD, not PD, defense is trying to be built very, very quickly, but uh, those missiles, they are targeting the right stuff. They're going after the PD. The once the, miss the once the PD is down, the other units can move in and take the rest of it out. But unfortunately, Zom will come with his nano and gun commander, and those missiles will not have a fighting chance to be able to deal. Again, you're shooting at a moving target. It's not great to shoot at a moving target. But I love the formation here. Nice little centered around a nice little Lobo. But uh, there are some T3 Percy's in the mix. Assisted by a shield and some... Actually, there's some Ilshis as well and some Titans. So, love the mix of units. Wish there was probably two or three more skyboxes here just to deal with any sort of maybe gunships that Team 1 might be built. But besides that, very good force. You got to get the Percy's in there to deal all that alpha damage to take out the Titans. And you see after those are dead, everything just falls apart. The Percy, however, not moving. Not great because the uh, Lobo can do lots of damage and it hurts. And there goes a Titan and an Ilshu because of it. So do not, uh, do not stop building T1 or T2 just because you have T3. But you can just see just due to that, those... You know, a couple of T1 Lobos were able to take out a T3 Percy because the Percy wasn't moving. But now we have another attack, this ba this time outbound on the east side of that little pond area. Here for Team 2's Martins coming in for the main base here for Arima. Actually, that's his main base over here. If this was the base for... I think that was Zero. And Arima has now been caught. Do the forces turn around and go after him, or do they keep going in? Unfortunately, because they're going through a narrow neck of land like this, it bunches them up together and all the forces can't attack at the same time, thereby rendering a lot of them kind of moot because they have to deal with pathfinding issues and all the like. So that's, uh, that's not great there. I can do that because you don't need that icon up. And now Arima's coming in with his T3 forces from behind and a lot of these units are just being eaten, just gobbled up for breakfast. Actually, I think at this time it'd be lunch in terms of the game time. But... At 25 minutes, let's take a recap of the game so far. Team 1 and Team 2 have three players left. Team 2 at 750 mass a second. Team 1 at 690, so trailing about 50 or 60 mass, depending on mass distractors actually still being alive and power generated issues, whatever the case may be. Team 1 and Team 2 essentially own about 50% of the map. Eh, mostly, say average, about 50%. And let me know down in the comments who you think is going to currently win the game. Again, thank you so much for all of the support while I was gone. I am back, and I can respond to your comments. And you don't have to worry about waiting a week or so to actually get a response from me. I, uh, you know, I'm back. I'm back. I'm back home with a computer with actual internet. So again, thank you so much for your patience. Again, thank you so much for watching. And please, if you haven't done so already, hit the share button to share this video with anyone and everyone. Hit the subscribe button. And again, thank you so much for watching. And we will continue on with the cast. We do see, again, that group of units here for Team 2's Zom. Constantly pushing in against Team 1's T1 Hero. We do see, again, those Titans are running in the face of Titans and Percy's. And those Percy's are r really are packing the punch here. We do see a group of Titans here in the middle. I would love to see Team 1's Arima refocus on Percy's. You can see it just takes forever to take out Percy's for these Titans. Again keep saying it thousand of anything will kill anything but you know rapid fire or high fire rate only matters for so long before it's like okay i gotta 
you know, got to fire at something. But gonna nuke, says Better G. And does he have a nuke launcher? No, but maybe he says he's going to uh, going for a nuke. It is almost 30 minutes in this game. Team 2's air player thinking about ending the game with nuclear hellfire. That's always one way to end it. Team 1, do they have a kind of idea? No, not really. Goose, yeah, that's a T3P gen. No, don't really see anything on the cards here for either team besides the mention of a nuke for strategy. We do see again those Titans are moving in. The Titans need to refocus onto the T1 units, and the Percy's redouble their efforts onto the T3 units. You can see that T1 units actually getting a decent amount of damage done just because the Percy's are ignoring them. Actually, excuse me, the Titans were ignoring them, but now the Percy's are just being swarmed. It's like Zerg Rush, you know, a thousand of those little guys can kill off one of those, uh, I forget the, not Basilisks, I forget what they're called. T3 Bomber over the top here for Team 1's. Pepe is going after those T3 units, and he would have been perfectly fine, but now the air fight ensues, and I think Betterji has the numbers, and especially with that split formation there. Oh, it's got to hurt. The bomber gets caught in the in that uh, engagement, and all those air units are down. Team 2 has air control. We do see Team 1's Arima going into the air game as well to assist his main air player, uh, Pepe's. We also see Arima now in the water all the way back here. And there is no way to access that from the land, so you'd have to use a transport to get yourself in there. So there is that. Air 1 says better G. Yep, the air is 1 for his team for now. You can't get too cocky because, you know, something can happen. Team 1 builds a lot of AA. You fly it over it, and there it goes. See you. Bye. But T3 units charging forth on the northern side of things. There is a lightning tank in the mix as well, but an, don't, it's not enough to push through. There's a lot of firepower here, but I don't know if it's enough to really risk it. Arima playing very, not necessarily conservative with it, but it's a, he's aggressively conservative. Or conservatively aggressive. Uh, no, conservatively aggressive. That's a better way to put it. He wants to be aggressive, but uh, he's starting to be you know, kind of in a bad way here. He's being attacked from the northwest, the east, and the south. We see how Ravager was able to fire up a little bit over that plateau. Though... Those units got to be careful. It's a lot of mass and you know energy to use to build these. So you got to be very careful with it. But in the northwest, again, I feel like I'm a broken record. I mentioned this before. This attack vector has been kind of a sore spot here for Team 1. And now that main base, that T3 land headquarters, is going down. It's not a matter of if. It is a matter of when. A couple of Othams are raining in, going after the missile launchers. There are a lot. There's a couple of T3 ones as well, spearheads. And T1 Engineers hurriedly trying to keep that facility online. They're repping it up as fast as they can. T1 PD being built as well. And now the units are given the order to engage with those Othams now out of range. It's a and now it's just enough. And those T1 PD, are they going to be enough? I don't think so. There's a lot of firepower here. Even if it's T2 or T1, a couple of T3. Oh, oh, they... I'm actually really surprised that T3 land headquarters is still online. I'm really, really surprised. I'm surprised that Martin didn't just go for it and be done with it. He would have locked Team 1 out of T3 air. Sorry, T3 land. There's another one back here, so I guess he couldn't have known that. Or maybe he could have. Let's see. No, he does. Okay, so it doesn't really matter, but still, that entire base would be gone. There's no engineers coming out of that facility. There's more being prepped as we speak. T3 ones to build some T3 mixes. But uh, definitely this side is just getting chipped away ever so slightly here for Team 1. And it's, again, starting to be a very sore spot. Another attack up the middle here for Team 2's Zom. And an attack in the east I saw earlier with the Fat Boy. And the Chicken now as well. But Team 2 has a Fat Boy. They are not pumping out units. Maybe they were a couple of seconds ago. Ooh, that's going to hurt. Ooh, I felt that. Ooh, was that, a, that was definitely a missile launcher. That was an Aloha. That is definitely an Aloha. And uh, one missile launches again. That's going to hurt. Oh, are those Flapjacks missiles or are those? Oh, I can't tell now because it's dead. That missile launcher from over here, definitely well placed. That's going to hurt and force that fat boy back. Oh, man. That took like half its hit points out. Oof. That's got to hurt. I felt that. T3 attack in the middle once again, but with the broadswords now here for Better G, there's not a lot of AA support, and they're probably all dead. There are some cougars coming in, but and some flak, but 
They're targeting the T3 units, the main battle tank for Team 1's Western line. And after those fall, the def it's not enough to break through the defenses and the units here for Team 2, especially with more gunships coming online all the time. How is that nuke going that he said he was going to build? He's not, I guess. Maybe he's not. That's this. You said you promised the nuke and you didn't deliver, Better G. Why? Why? Why do you say such things? Why do you wound me so? Lots of pings going down here for Team... Wow, that's a lot of pings. What is going on? Is that from Team 2? No, that's from Team 1. Do oh, oh. <laughs> He's like, hey, there's this giant you know, group of gunships you could go after. It's essentially what he's getting at. Like, what is going on with that? Those forces have to retreat. There is a chicken inbound. And they're coming up against a lot of titans and a couple of flapjacks, a couple of uh, spearheads. But honestly, there's not a lot of Percy's. That chicken will just rip right through that force. It will do some damage to it. But uh, titans being the only essentially high-powered unit in that mix, not great. If that chicken, yep, that chicken's going to go for it. And that chicken's going to rip that front line right open. And now in the east, that chicken is doing the exact same thing in the east. He does have a group of T3 units back here, but they're all very slow. And a shield generator. And one flag. Sorry, one AA. There's one flag. That's T3. And it does look like, uh, yeah, game, game render says better G. Uh, no, but they might be prepping for it given the angle of all those... Uh, engineering stations it is 33 minutes and again those teams gotta be thinking about this because the longer you wait to build a game ender the longer it will take to get there unless you have just a million mass in your bar for some reason and uh just you know that other team will be that far ahead of you and especially in the terms of you know mavors or yolos the more nukes you can launch the better of course because they're and they load faster and the like Fat boy lineup being built in the middle of a uh, air grid there for Team 2's strategy. Again, decentralization. Love to see that. Um, I think those are a little too close. I don't remember the AOE explosions on those, but uh, yeah, it's a little close. A little close. At least for me, it's a little close. It could be perfectly fine, but uh, it's still a little close. That land army was immediately taken out, and that uh, squadron of stuff gunships is perfectly fine for the time being. But Team 1 is really inching back. They want the territory back in the west. And they're starting to rebuild. It looks like Team 2's focus is now on this army that's inbound. And when we saw Team 1 taking the eastern side, essentially the southeastern side, and Team 2 taking the northwestern side, it's now flip-flopped again, where now Team 1 is trying to take back the, you know, the spot they originally had, and now Team 2 is focusing on the southern side. And they're being pushed back. They have... At least the chicken is being pushed back. They have a fat boy. I don't know why the chicken is falling back. I know there's a lot of spam inbound. You can see that. It's just a lot of stuff moving around. But uh, I don't I don't know if that chicken... The, the chicken can easily engage. The chicken should not be back here. The Percy's, yeah, and the Titans, it's nice to have that. It's kind of a buffer, but the chicken needs to engage. It would have forced these units back a lot quicker. That fat boy can sit here. Is it... Are you pumping out anything? No. Maybe you pumped out a cougar. I don't know. You should be using those factories on board, those things, to pump out something. There is a T2 radar that he could definitely take out. He's going after the defenses first. He has an attack brewing in the west as well with some gunships inbound. Might be going after this spot. There is a couple of clink hammers. More shields are coming. Actually, a lot more shields are coming online. In the north... It kind of going out. Looks like the chicken was definitely assassinated. Probably by some gunships, most likely, just given the fact that there's not a lot of wreckage around it. Those gunships are now inbound for that position I mentioned earlier. They're going after the clean cameras, probably trying to protect the fat boy. That's their main mission. Ravagers probably will be the next target after that. Oh, it looks like it's the T2 PD. T2 AA is now going to be the target. Yeah, they're not going to... Uh, looks like that base is done and dusted. Team 2 doesn't really have air control. They have a little bit of air left, but it does look like there was an air fight a couple of seconds ago. Most of the gunships have been whittled down, but the Percy's are now coming in to assist. And that fat boy's still sitting over here. 
Still not really doing a whole lot, but just being in there. Chicken over here protecting it. Fat Boy is moving in from the south. A lot of T1 spam. Team 1's T1 hero is producing some cougars on the back of this thing. So, again, using his faction bonus to his advantage with the factory on board the back of that experimental. That's more experimental bonus. Anyway. Multiple fat boys in the north for defense. Martin is not going to let Team 1 break through this front line. And he's using both of his fat boys to produce. I think those are the cougars still. Yeah, just producing a ton of cougars. Cougars, cougars, and more cougars. Just can't have enough cougars, apparently. In the east, there is a Duke coming online here for Team 2's better G. So didn't go for Nuke. He lied. And is going for T3 artillery. And in the south, don't see any sort of response to that. Again, as always, the Team 1 know about it. No, they don't know. Oh, that's not great. You can see this is what they know. That's what exists. That's not great. Team 1 hasn't scouted in a while. That is definitely not great. Should be, I think, average couple of minutes for, you know, 1 to 20 minutes. And then every, like, 3 minutes or something. 4 minutes. 5 minutes at max for essentially 30 minutes plus. But that's that's not. That, that takes a lot of time to build that stuff up. That is the wrong, wrong player. That's a lot a lot they don't know about they're going to be surprised by that artillery here pretty soon especially with a chicken and a fat boy moving into their front yard there is a chicken trying to intercept said chicken but uh, even if they kill the chicken it's still going to be a murder suicide situation so nothing really adventured and gained more of a delaying tactic the fat boy twin army has been actually made a lot of progress in pushing back team one team one being hemmed in both in the north and in the south Giving a lot of breathing room for here for Team 2. There is a possible counterattack mounting in the south, but that army needs to rotate eastward and then westward. But it does look like that chicken is mounting some sort of attack or at least some sort of line up. Fat Boy says zoo. Oh, I already looked at that one. I don't see anything else of note. The artillery should be done. It is. It's going to get quad ringed here pretty soon. Or ringed, I should say. And shields, again, I do not agree with the whole build all four T3 P gens first, then build the shield. At least build one. Just one. Not doesn't have to build all of them, but just one would be good just to make sure that, uh, you know, a couple of strap bombers don't come in and just wreck your face. But he's building shield now, which is good, but kind of delayed. Artillery focusing on the air grid, very typical, of course, because... If your enemy knows that you built artillery, he's going to build strap bombers or something to take it out. Might as well take out the air grid. And I, again, Team 1, I don't think they really have a way to fight back at this. Oi. <laughs> says uh, the zero in the north. A couple of T3 Rossers going after T3 Max. And that position has been there the entire game. So I would say not that bad considering he got a lot of value out of that. But the artillery is still raining in on Team 1's air grid. And the T3 air headquarters has taken a hit. Shields are still online. They're being assisted as we speak to rep up its capacity. With one artillery, that amount of support should be fine. With two artillery, it's definitely concerning. So Team 1's definitely got to think about that. They got to keep, they got to scout. They just got to know either where it is or what's going on. And as I speak, there is a scout inbound coming up from Arima. You'll be able to see a lot of what's going on. He's to divert a little bit to the west, which he does. He should be able to see all that. Oh, yeah, he sees at least the one. That's the most important one, obviously, because that's the one online. So he's got to start mounting an attack. It does look like there is some counterattacking going down here in the south here for Team 1's arena as well. There is that fat boy has rotated from the southern section now to over here. A lot of T3 Percy's. That is a lot of Percy's. Jeez. And that chicken did retreat as well here for Zelma on the eastern side. But with two fat boys, the spam isn't really going to get anywhere. And this is just engineer spam, too. Just attacks the cannons. Not really much of anything. There's a couple of units up here. But uh, fat boys still able to reach after some of those. And those uh, Othams are like, nah, it's probably not a good idea. 
Martin definitely doesn't want to repeat what he did to Arima by, you know, having him come over on the northeastern, northwestern side over here. He's posted up a decent amount of units. And with the shields, the titans, a couple of those flapjacks. Or no, those are flapjacks. It's a decent amount of force. We'd love to see some Percy's in the mix, but it looks like they're actually going to be given orders to engage or at least move a little bit forward and come around. A lot of AAs being built here for Arima to defend against the air advantage that Team 2 definitely has. Good to see that. Artillery still raining in on the same spot. That Pigeon is going to get reclaimed just so it doesn't, you know, cascade. It won't cascade, but it would kill off all the engineering support, and that's never a good thing. So. And even if that uh, Pigeon does get hit again, because it's constantly being reclaimed, the AoE explosion from it being volatile will be null and void. But a combined attack here from Arima and Team One Hero pushing in on the southern edge. They're going to move, I think, all the way eastward and then probably northward. This is definitely where Team Two is a little bit weaker. There are a couple of squadrons of T1 bombers inbound these Scorchers. I always think they're Zeus from the Cybrans, but there are no Cybrans in this game, so they're definitely not Zeus. But the T1AA on uh, the T1 AA, the AA on board that uh, chicken is enough to deal with it, but some assisting T3 definitely doesn't hurt, and some boxer and boxers as well. Do you tell you you got T1, T2, and T3 AA shooting at you? Definitely not the best mix of uh, AA to fly in. But second artillery in the green starting to be very dangerous here for Team 2. I'm assuming somebody might be building a Another one, no, no, no. another fat boy, another fat boy. That one's not even being built. Oh, no, it's slowly being built. Don't really see much of anything else. I do love this. That uh, better just gonna build a shield here, just to protect. You know, there's four T3 mexes with double ringed, a lot of mass fabs to just blow up, especially being that close to one another. Team one, it looks like they've reclaimed the southern edge once again. Five planes coming to the top, trying to get a readout on what's going on. Does Team 2 not have an SM... Okay, they do. I was like, do they not have an SMD? They do. Uh, do we have nuke defense, says Martin? And yet yeah, plus being yes. And more shields are being built to protect that air grid. But uh, again, one artillery is fine. Two artillery, not great. Three is dead. At least with that amount of support. But not loaded, 70%. Does Team 1 have it? I don't see a nuke. Unless I'm blind, because, you know, I kind of am, to be fair. So, now there is a duke going to be started here pretty soon by Team 1. But I feel like that's a little late. Their, their path to victory might just be on the ground. They have enough forces, but it does look like Team 2 censoring. Most of the forces are over here, and they can't really respond very quickly. Move in and try to cut off the supply lines here for Team 1. And so far, that's actually doing a decent job. You can see the Titans moving in. Would love to see actually more Percy's in there versus uh, Titans there for Team 2. There is the Chicken, though. That's really going to be the main powerhouse here. There are Percy's behind the Chicken, to be fair. But they're not out in front. They should be out in front. And it does look like this will distract Team 1 once again, force all of that momentum back towards the main base and give Team 2's Zum enough time to build up more defenses. He does have PD. He does have a Chicken. But he needs more, and he feels like, and he probably needs. He does have a fat boy coming in to assist as well. Iota says, oh, what? Oh, Zum is building the T4 Experimental Maver, the longest artillery in the game. And I say longest because it is the longest. It is uh, tr maybe trying to compensate. Who knows? But that's just what it is. It looks like the artillery from Team 2 has been retasked and going after T3 mass fat farms. And uh, one misses. Essentially, the other one does hit a target but doesn't explode because it wasn't actually built yet. And that's going to be... Again, the, the downside with artillery is that it's, it's not great sometimes in terms of accuracy. It's fine for some things, but... We're going to have to target in a widespread environment. Not super great. We do see that chicken is in the red and is trying to be retreated due to the chicken nearby here for Arima. And uh, this is not really... I mean, going after T3 Mexes is good, but uh, being chased by Percy's is definitely not. If the Percy's were retasked, I don't think they'd have enough damage anyways, but uh, still. This attack from Team 2 might... It's not the 
spell that breaks the camel's back, but it definitely will annoy Team 1, especially with that chicken now moving into assist. The chicken had enough time to move in and try to go after maybe T1 Heroes, Calm, or just go after the production facilities. But uh, not anymore. Once that chicken caught up, that's it. And that AoE... Yep, there it goes. We can take out the rest of those units. And that attack outbound from Team 2 has been neutralized. Team 1 has another attack. They took out a fat boy. Looks like they took out the... No? That looks like that was just, that was just a kill. Chicken down over here to the west. Let's see that. The other fat boy did retreat up here. They're getting another one to uh, not recompensate it, but we bet it. We Dude, what's the word for it? Not reinitialize it or replace it. Wow, I couldn't figure out the word for replace. My brain is mush today, apparently. Fat boy pushing in. There is a fat boy and a chicken, so that fat boy and chicken will win out against that soul fat boy right here. And it's zero veterancy versus two, but uh, the shield capacity doesn't get affected by the veterancy, so it doesn't really matter, especially with Natha's inbound here from the east. They are facing a lot of AA pressure, and they will get some damage done on the shields, but there are a lot of para shields here as well, and it's more and more engineers. It looks like maybe shields as well going to be built. Maybe those are skyboxes. No, those are para shields, I think. Yeah, those are definitely para shields. How is the air grid doing here for Team 1? It's still holding. As I say that, they uh, lost that Pigeon finally. Maybe it just finally re got reclaimed. One solitary shield will stay online. Don't know if that's the best course of action. Well, it is the best course of action given what they have, but I think the land assault is definitely their best avenue in terms of Team 1, at least on the southern side. The fat point is actually retreating here for team two, which is actually what you want because you want to draw them in close enough because those uh, those gunships are coming in and it's uh, gonna hurt. Here come those gunships, they are inbound. Again, their solitary mission taking out the fat boy, which they will accomplish here, right? There it goes. And even if they all die, the main goal has been, again, accomplished. The chicken is now moving in as well. The fat boy did lose its shield, but it's still alive, so that is definitely a benefit to Team 2. And again, the second artillery is online. Not building anything else. There is a satellite, and the Mavor is in the yellow. So I feel like if Team 1 can break in through this middle section and at least take out the Mavor and maybe try to take out the artillery, they'll, have, they'll buy a lot of time for them to build up what they need to. But with two artillery and possibly a satellite on its way, that field needs a lot more assistance than just what it has. And probably some secondary shields. You see the, the other emitters here on the northern side were taken up by the satellite. That's gonna hurt. Constant pressure from the satellite, press constant pressure from the artillery. It's, it's just gonna hurt. It's gonna tax Pepe's uh, energy reserves and the likes. It's definitely gonna hurt. Team one is holding on against that the firepower of that magnitude. Attack in the north once again. Chicken very weak and second chicken coming in as well. That chicken is going to die. Dix gets a nice triple kill there against some, uh, I think those were demolishers, I think. But, uh, hmm. maybe using this chicken as bait. It's five star veterancy, 100,000 hit points. You can have 100,000 hit points on a chicken. That's a little bit less, that's a little, actually, it's a little bit more than a Colossus. It's standard Colossus, no veterancy. And, this, and the southern edge has been broken. But uh, there is, I guess, a, fa a chicken came out of the water. But with now multiple T3 Ravagers, T2 Triads, Fat Boy, second Fat Boy going to come online here very shortly. They got built very, very quickly, I might add. These chickens now have to divert over here to the east. And even if they take this out, they're going to be severely weakened because of it. And all that allows is for Team 1 to come in. There's also that Fat Boy right there, so there's actually three Fat Boys on there. Uh, the attack probably should have just went for that Mavor if they knew about it, which they probably did. I made a comment about it earlier, so they definitely did. That chicken will engage. You need to send the chicken in. The chicken needs to go in. Go into the base, take everything out. If you're going to go for it, now's the time. But I feel like earlier was the time to just go straight for that, uh, straight for that base. But now there's a fourth fat boy. It's not looking great here for Team 1's land army that I thought could maybe do it, but it doesn't look like they went after the right target. That's probably what it really comes down to. Let me know down in the comments how you felt about that. 
who, do you think they had enough forces, given when I came and looked at it, to just charge the front line and at least go after the Maevor at a minimum? I think they do, especially with the chickens, you know, AOE, you know, Ion Storm attack. Definitely could have been enough, but now you have one, two, three fat boys targeting that solitary chicken, plus all the PD. Both the chickens actually die out of that main shield base. That's essentially just a giant glorified fire base with an SMB and a bunch of PD on it. Now the eastern side will be perfectly fine here for Team 2 to defend with. The western side, again, that western attack once again comes in, and now the T3 land headquarters will definitely fall in this regard, especially with all of the units trailing in constantly. This is not looking good. How's the air grid looking? Still perfectly fine. The T3 air headquarters was taken out. They cannot build T3 air facilities, or sorry, air units until they repair it, but there is a Duke under construction. Second Duke down here for T1 Hero. I feel like Team 2 was put together a little bit more in that regard. Nano advanced Nano Repair going down here for Zum. Another Fat Boy has been built in Arima Control Case saying, Nah, I'm done. See you. Bye. Kind of done with this game. Artillery remaining in on his air base. That's gone from a satellite and artillery fire. I do love that Team 2 redirected the artillery fire because sometimes you kind of get tunnel vision with, like, I want this target dead. I want it dead. I want it dead. I want it dead. And you kind of get distracted by it. But Team 1 Hero Control Case, that is now Pepe's versus the world here. And I think at that point we can kind of see where the game is going. There he goes. Pepper's in his main base. Good job, says Martin. I think Martin did a very good job. Again, constantly pressuring that western side. He saw that they were weak, and there goes the last player now on Team 2. It is Pepe's. He is D-E-D, -E and this is a game one for Team 2. And I think, as I mentioned before, I think Martin deserves MVP. Maybe even, M honestly, MUP and MVP. I think he deserves at least maybe a couple hundred more points of rating. He held the West very well. He got a kill on zero, which I didn't know how he did, but he did it, so there's that. He came in on the West multiple times, and had Arima just diverted more forces over here to defend, I know he was busy doing the East and the West thing. You know, that's not all, not not really ultimately what killed him. Is essentially it was a amalgamation of the pressure from the North, the artillery from the back, and Team One not really being able to attack from the Southern Edge. And they should they should have just went for it. They they obviously lost this attack, but had they went for it. They would have done some damage. They would have maybe killed off a couple of fat boys because that's one, two, three, four, five. That's a lot of fat boys. Just to have. So I think the game may have turned out differently for Team 1, but I think ultimately Team 2 definitely had it in the bag once they started building artillery and started playing the long game. They didn't focus so much on the land game, but definitely Martin, M MUP at the minimum, and definitely MV at a minimum, and most likely MVP. There could be arguments that maybe Better G had MVP or Zum had MVP, but I think Martin, in my case, gets MVP because I think he broke Team One, at least on that Western side, a little bit sooner, and just kept Team One on the defenses long enough for his teammates to build up defenses and build up other things to attack and take out Team One. Let me know down in the comments how you felt. Again, please. Thank you so much for watching. Please, if you haven't done so already, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, and share this video with anyone, everyone, and especially your pets. Again, thank you so much for watching. I'm grateful to be back. I'm grateful to be back in the saddle and making content for every single one of you. Thank you so much for watching.